so much, Amy, and happy Friday, everyone. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that we are at the end of this week. Um, I'm excited to be talking with you today about the best practices for personnel file maintenance and how you can survive a personnel file audit. Um, I'm actually in the midst of three different personnel file audits for clients. Each one is going very differently. Um, so I know that there are a lot of different approaches to personnel file management. And what I'd like to talk about here today are best practices so that you can survive a personnel file audit. My name is Lori Dahlberg, as Amy mentioned, and I am the HR Consulting Senior Manager here at I Bailey. I've been with the firm for almost 19 years now and have been in the HR profession for over 30 years. Very excited to um, bring HR expertise to our clients and to share my knowledge through these types of webinars. So um, I reside in the Boise office now. I spent 18 years of my career in our Minneapolis office um, and have relocated back home to Boise um, and really look forward to just sharing my knowledge. So as Amy mentioned, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. We will try our best to answer those questions during the presentation. Um, if I do run out of time, I will download those questions and we'll send responses out to all of the participants. All right, so let's get started. We're gonna talk about best practices for personnel file maintenance. And in order to kick that off, you kind of need to understand why there's a need for a personnel file audit. Um, employment records are actually regulated by a government agency called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And what they are responsible for doing is making sure that employers are keeping accurate records and appropriate documentation on employees and not retaining information that has no relevance to the employment of an individual. So in the mind of the EEOC, employment records include all documentation and information regarding all employment activities, which include the recruitment process, hiring of individuals, compensation and what you pay your employees, benefits, performance, medical information, including leaves of absence, reasonable accommodation, and of course, more recently, COVID-related information, and then any other information that you file and retain about an employee. So when it comes to employee file best practices, um, these are the key factors. Number one, you want to make sure that you are filing information separately on an employee. You want to make sure that you have a personnel file, that you have a benefit and medical file, and that you have a payroll or confidential file for all employees. Now, these could be hard copy files, or it could be information that you store either electronically um, in folders on a drive or through an HRIS system. But this type of information should be filed separately, and we'll get to the reasons why and what to include in each of those folders. There are additional files to maintain as well, though, that should be filed separately, and those include recruitment files, so all of the information related to a position that you're recruiting for, as well as any Form I-9s for your current employees and Form I-9s for terminated employees. All of this information must be filed separately. You can't just keep it all in one file. And again, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail here. Another employee file best practice is to make sure that you are restricting access to an employee's employment information so that only those who really need to have access to the information have access. For example, supervisors should only have access to the personnel file, and we're going to talk about what goes into a personnel file. HR has access to all records because typically they're the ones who are maintaining the employment related files. Employees can always access any information um, in their personnel files or any files that are maintained by HR. And then there's law enforcement and the EEOC they would also have access to all records. So setting up security parameters around who can access your files will mitigate risk for you and will also ensure that only the individuals who should be accessing information are truly accessing that information. 
I wanted to make sure that I did make a note here that some individuals still maintain paper files and that's perfectly fine. And as we're talking about paper files, we wanna make sure that you understand when I'm saying you need to file things separately, it means you need to have a separate folder or file in a separate locked cabinet for each of the areas that we're going to discuss. Um, for some, that could mean that you just have a few different file cabinets they have different locks on them. File cabinet number one is for personnel files. File cabinet number two is for um, payroll or confidential files. And file cabinet number three is for your um, benefit or medical related files. For those of you who are doing things electronically where you scan information, as long as you have them in separate folders and what I've typically seen for clients is that they might have um, employee personnel files as one folder on a drive. And then within that, it's this is Bob Jones file and Bob Jones has a personnel file, a payroll confidential file and a benefit medical file so that information can be stored in those different electronic files. And with HRIS systems, typically those tools have um, built in security factored in already so that you can set security access to individuals to um, be able to look at different information within the HRIS system. So just make sure that, that as you are retaining information that, and keeping them in separate files that you truly are doing it in a manner so that only individuals who should access the information can access it. It also goes a long way with regards to organizing personnel information on employees so that you can easily and efficiently find information when you're looking for it. All right, and I hope you have your bifocals on um, because the list of items to include in a personnel file are is lengthy. And remember, the personnel file is the file that a supervisor or manager can access or anybody in the upwards uh, reporting structure. It's something that the employee can access, HR can access, and then EEOC, government agencies or law enforcement can access. The personnel file is truly what talks about the employee and their performance and everything related to their job and how they're doing and performing that job and what they're being paid in that job. So in the personnel file, you will have any new hire information. So you might retain the offer letter, a resume. If you require transcripts or professional certifications, um, this is where you would store a copy of that documentation. If you have staff agreements, confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements, um, any non-competes if your state allows those, any kind of standard form that an employee might complete um, when they're going through orientation that relates to their employment, this is where you would file that. In the personnel file, we also will find performance documentation and performance documentation can include standard performance evaluations, it might include performance write-ups or uh, corrective actions or a performance improvement plan. It also can contain kudos. So if someone is receiving some positive input regarding their performance, a copy of that can be filed in their personnel file. We also will find general compensation information. So if you have pay change notifications or um, adjustments to FLSA status, um, or any bonuses that are paid out. Any of those types of notifications will be found in the personnel file. And then of course, there's job specific information. Uh, I've been working with a number of clients in the banking industry and I find that in that particular industry, they have employees sign job descriptions. I think that's brilliant. Um, it's a great way to document that an employee understands what's expected of them. Here's your job description. We'll go ahead and um, have an employee sign and date it if they get a promotion or they level up or there are changes to job responsibilities or their job description is updated, they get a fresh copy and they sign and date it. Um, so that information would go into a personnel file, as well as any kind of notifications regarding a promotion or a demotion um, or job change. All of that documentation can be found in the personnel file. If you have trainings or certifications that you put employees through, uh, you would want to retain any of that type of documentation in the personnel file. And then of course, any acknowledgements that you have employees sign, whether it's an employee handbook, it's a policy or a policy change, um, those types of acknowledgements would be found in the personnel file. 
again, this file is accessible by supervisors, managers, those higher up in their reporting structure, um, because it relates to the employee and their actual performance of job duties. The next type of file um, would be your benefit or medical file. And this type of file is only accessible by the employee, human resources, or whoever is handling that function for you, or government agencies. Included in your benefit medical file would be information such as benefit enrollment forms. So when a new hire joins and they sign up for benefits, any type of documentation related to their benefit enrollment would go in their benefit file. If they go through annual enrollment and they make changes, um, you would want to put that information in there. Any information related to their medical, dental, or vision coverage, their life insurance coverage, flex spending, HSA, HRA, or retirement, any type of benefit enrollment information would go into this file. This is also the place where you will keep any medical information, such as reasonable accommodation requests or medical leaves, doctor's notes, or COVID-related documentation, whether it's to state that they have COVID, um, they need to quarantine, um, or they need to stay home and take care of somebody who is quarantining. Um, any FICRA-related documentation should go in this file as well. And the reason that this file should not be accessed by supervisors, managers, or others outside of uh, the human resource function is that this information really has nothing to do with the employee's ability to perform their job. Um, if they have to quarantine, the reason for the quarantine, or if they need to go on a leave of absence, the reason for going on a leave of absence is not really um, information that the supervisor needs to know. They don't need to know the reason for it. They need, to be, they need to know that the employee has to go on a leave of absence or has to quarantine. But the reason for it is not information that the supervisor or any others in the reporting structure need to have. That's oftentimes a difficult concept, right? Because sometimes as we're working with our employees, we do get to know them and employees will share information. Um, but we wanna make sure that uh, you understand that the reason behind some of this stuff is irrelevant. Um, if they qualify for a leave of absence, the reason why they qualify for that leave of absence has no bearing on, on how they perform their job. It's just the fact that the supervisor needs to be told they're going to be on a leave of absence. So that's why this information is kept separate from the personnel file. The third type of um, file that, that we maintain is a payroll confidential file. And basically this file is a file that you keep everything that could have security related information for the employee. So social security number, um, banking information, um, payroll deduction information, that type of stuff is kept out of the personnel file because again, it has nothing to do with an employee's ability to perform their job. It may have an impact on payroll or different factors like that. So within the payroll confidential file, we would find things like the W-4, the direct deposit, any legal documents that might be submitted um, as it relates to changing benefits or changing someone's name or um, changing beneficiary information. So um, if somebody gets married or if they get divorced or if there's child custody situations that would result in wage garnishments, uh, death certificates for a spouse or a dependent in order to collect life insurance information, um, criminal history documentation, background checks, that type of information would go in this payroll confidential file. Another piece of information that you might find in here would be verifications of employment, either the requests or the responses. Some, some companies like to retain all of that information so that if an employee inquires, hey, what did you tell the bank um, when I submitted my verification of employment, you have the actual document that you submitted to the bank when that request for verification of employment came through. It's not required that you retain that information, but if you do retain that type of documentation, you will want to file it in your payroll confidential area. If somebody applies for a loan um, and um, there, there's some documentation there, 
it would go in the payroll confidential file. And I see that a lot with my banking clients. Sometimes they have employees who apply for loans with the bank and they retain the information in a payroll confidential file. As I mentioned previously, background check results. If you do background checks as part of your hiring process and the individual is hired, you could retain that background check in your payroll confidential file. And any other documentation um, that affects employment decisions that don't fit into your standard personnel file area or the benefit medical file area. So with the payroll confidential file, the individuals who can access this would be the employee, human resources or payroll, whoever does your payroll can access the payroll related information. And then of course, governmental agencies. So in order to conduct an HR organizational audit, if you wanna do it yourself, or if you wanna have someone like me come in and do it for you, what you want to do is you're going to create files for each of your current employees. Um, so if you know that you only have all the information in one file, you are gonna go through um, your employee list and you are going to create a personnel file, a benefit medical file, and a payroll file for each and every one of your employees. And then you're going to want to create a form I-9 file. And we're gonna talk a lot about I-9s here in a little bit. Um, you need to have one file for your current employees and one file for your terminated employees. You have to keep I-9s separate from any other personnel or HR related documentation. I myself find it extremely easy to create a binder and to have um, those, those slip sheets, those cover sheets for each of my I-9s uh, for employees. It has the I-9, it has the supporting documentation, um, and I just retain it in alphabetical order so that if somebody terminates, I go into the binder, I pull their I-9 out of it, and I put it in the terminated employee binder. Um, so you want to make sure that you create a file for your I-9s. You then want to think to yourself, what are all of the different required documents that we have employees sign? Do all employees do a W-4? They do a direct deposit. Um, they do their I-9. They do, um, you might have an employee handbook. So there's an employee handbook acknowledgement. You might have a confidentiality agreement. Uh, you might have some sort of um, industry specific document that employees need to sign. You have to think about what should, what should every single employee have signed in their personnel file that protects the company and mitigates risk. And once you've made a list of those, then you can go back and you can review the information in the personnel files that you maintain to see, are we missing any information? Does Bob Jones have all of our standard documents or is Bob missing the confidentiality agreement or is he missing the employee handbook acknowledgement form. It is really important for you to know what employees are missing so that you can go back and have them complete those documents so that they have complete personnel records in the event that something goes wrong. Inevitably, um, disgruntled employees um, who, who want to sue their employer oftentimes will win in their situation because the company is unable to prove that, oh, yes, here's our policy. They didn't follow our policy. They knew it was our policy because here is the signed employee handbook acknowledgement form. Um, so their claim that they didn't know that that was an expectation is incorrect, okay? Um, there, is, um, there is a great way of doing this. And when I do personnel file audits, I create an Excel spreadsheet. I have the employees' names listed down column A. And I have all of the required documentation going across um, the, the header row. And then as I go through each employee's personnel file, I check off which of the documents they have. And at the end, I see which documents are missing. And those are the ones I'm able to follow up with employees on. We do have a question that I do want to address. Is there a government statute that says you can't keep I-9 documents in a payroll file? Yes, there is. I don't know what the, I can't quote what the, the government um, section code is for that. Um, work authorization status is something that needs to be kept confidential. It has to be filed separately. That's not just a best practice. Uh, it, you can get into a lot of trouble if an I-9 is found in the file of an employee along with other employment-related documentation. And again, 
we're going to we're going to get to i9s it's a it's a big area that i i do like to spend some time on all right so as you're going through your personnel file audit um, you find that employees are missing some documents you go to those employees and they're like yeah i'm not going to I'm not going to sign that employee acknowledgement form. Here are your options. Um, number one, you can sit down with the employee to explain the need for the document to be completed. Just say, hey, we're performing an internal audit. Um, we found that you don't have the employee handbook acknowledgement form. We really need for you to sign it. If they refuse to sign it, you can either have them put on the document, I'm, I refuse to sign this form or you can make a note that you met with them and they refused to sign the form. Or you can make it a condition of their continued employment. I think it would be extremely risky to continue employing somebody who refuses to sign something like a confidentiality agreement or an employment agreement or an employee handbook acknowledgement form. Um, that to me is just a huge red flag that there's trouble ahead in the event that something doesn't go well with regards to their employment. So um, that I would just make sure that, that you put it down as a condition of employment. And we do have somebody that talks about union shops. Um, I will tell you, I am not an expert in union shops. So I apologize, but that's not an area of expertise that I have. So I, I can't provide much guidance on that. Um, I would just strongly encourage individuals to sign things. And if they refuse, at least you can document in there that you tried to get them to sign it and they refused it. But it, it could be a little bit more difficult for you down the road if something does head um, down the legal path. So with regards to recruitment information, when you open a position, my advice is to retain um, some sort of documentation, whether it's a job description, the, the job posting, um, you want to make sure that, that you are retaining information related to that position. And that way you're able to say, here's the position that we were recruiting for. Um, you will want to retain any information on job posting. So if you posted it on LinkedIn, on Indeed, on professional industry sites, retain some records on that. And um, that way you know, hey, were our recruitment efforts successful? Where are we finding our candidates? Should we waste our time and money on various sites that, that don't generate good candidates or any candidates? So retain that type of information. When you have applicants coming in, you wanna make sure that you're retaining consistent information, whether that is the resume, the application. Um, if you're requiring transcripts, you'll want to, to go ahead and um, keep that information as well and be consistent with it. Um, keep in mind that if you set a, a process, you need to follow your process. And so if your process says we collect transcripts from all candidates, you need to collect transcripts from all candidates, especially those that you hire and interview. Um, if you do phone screens, if you do interviews and you retain notes from those, that information needs to, to be retained. If you do background checks, credit checks, um, any type of reference checks, you'll want to retain that information. Uh, if you put together an offer for a candidate, you want those offer details and you want it for any candidate that you extended an offer to. Uh, so that you can demonstrate, yes, I extended offers to these three people and here's the one who accepted the offer. And then if you have voluntary gathering of voluntary EEO information as part of your process, you're going to wanna to make sure that you, um, you retain that information as well. But voluntary EEO information needs to be kept separate. When you have candidates um, and you've made your decision, go back through all of your candidates and then kind of organize what their status is. So you'll have the candidate or candidates that you hired. They will be in one section of the file. Then you might have a section for candidates that you extended an offer to, but you didn't hire either because they declined the offer um, or they withdrew at some point. You're gonna have the candidates that you interviewed who you didn't end up selecting. You'll have those that you maybe did a phone interview with that you didn't select. You'll have those candidates who were not qualified, so they did not receive an interview. You'll have candidates who withdrew at any point in the process prior to receiving an offer. And then you might have a section for individuals who failed the background check or any type of testing that you may have done. 
And you, you want to organize this at the time that you have filled the position because it's still fresh in your mind. Why you chose the candidates that you did, why you, chose, you didn't choose other candidates and why these candidates were, were not selected for interviews. Um, and we're gonna get to why that's helpful here in a minute. Um, for the candidates that you hire, you may want to keep a copy of the offer, the resume, transcripts um, in their personnel file so that you have that information. You may want to keep a copy of the background check or any testing results in their confidential file. It's not required, but certainly there are different points in time when uh, a question arises about an employee and it would be nice to see their resume. And if you have that in their personnel file, it just makes it a little easier for you to, to get the information that you're looking for. General recruitment information can be reviewed by the hiring manager or those up in the chain of command, human resources or the person performing that function and governmental agencies. So make sure that um, you are retaining that information. Voluntary EEO information should be kept in a separate file. Um, because an individual's EEO information is considered to be confidential and isn't related to their actual ability to do the job. So you go through a lot of effort to put together good personnel file practices and you've got your information organized and um, you spend a lot of time and effort on it and it needs to be for a purpose other than, well, what if we get audited, right? So what is the reason for maintaining all of these files. Um, one of the reasons is it does mitigate risk. Um, it helps you ensure that you're only retaining information that you should be retaining and that only those who should have access to it are accessing the information. But it also can help with recruitment and retention. So strong compliant recruitment records, retaining those, if you maintain organized records um, with the relevant important information on each candidate for a position, you can utilize that information for future hires, right? So let's say that you have a position and that position is filled by this person, but your second choice candidate was really, really good, a very strong candidate. If you have strong recruitment records, if that position opens again, or if you open up a second position, you can go back to those recruitment records and look for that second candidate and find their information quickly and reach out to them uh, to potentially extend an offer. So it's just a, a nice way of kind of having a database of candidates. Um, you also have situations where candidates that you interview, you're like, oh my gosh, this person would be fantastic for our organization just not for this particular position because maybe they lack the experience or maybe they're overqualified. And when a new position opens up, you have their information from the original time that they applied. So again, it's almost like it's creating a database or a pool of candidates for you to consider. Another reason is that it can turn these folks into um, kind of a, in, instead of it being a cold call where um, I don't know about you guys, but I know that at I Bailey, we are constantly searching for experienced people and we're having to do what headhunters do, right? We're having to call into organizations. We're sourcing people through the internet or through LinkedIn or through various channels. Um, and we're having to reach out to people that we don't, we don't know. They have no connection with I Bailey whatsoever. When you maintain strong recruitment records on your candidates, you are actually, that pool of candidates ends up being more of a, a warm call instead of a cold call. They've already expressed an interest in your company. They know about your company because they applied for a previous position. And now you're actually able to reach out to them. So the other thing to keep in mind is that maintaining these types of records, um, you may have interviewed somebody for an entry level position five years ago right? And you really liked them from a personality perspective, but they were just too green. And now you have this experienced position that you're trying to fill. You can go back to some of your recruitment records or your databases of candidates from previous years to find folks who were entry level five years ago now have five years of experience and might be worth looking at. So you could have, again, that pool of candidates that you're, that you're looking at, all based on the fact that you have organized recruitment records that you can go back to. 
In the area of employment related records, if you maintain compliance in employment related records, it really does allow you to um, efficiently and effectively utilize the information when making employment related decisions. Um, so keeping the performance information in a personnel file, you can go to that file quickly, look through the performance information to see a pattern of behavior that might require attention, either positive attention or um, more negative, I guess is the term, attention. So looking at their performance data in an organized manner, you can see if somebody might have the skill set, either for promotion or for some skill development. Um, they've been with your organization for a while. They've been proficient in this area. Um, you'd like to get them to the next level. You have their performance-related documentation in the file where you can kind of base some decisions on how are we going to get them to that next level. If you just have everything scattered in one file or if you're not maintaining good records, you don't have any idea of a pattern of behavior or how to address it. The other thing is that having your, your information organized allows you to see performance behaviors that maybe are, are not meeting expectations. And you're able to see it in an organized manner so that you can deal with performance issues to either get employees on the right track or document things so that you can terminate. The other thing is that keeping your medical or benefit information together allows you to handle certain situations that employees might experience in an efficient manner. And employees actually appreciate it when, when you kind of know what is going on, you, you know their situation so that you can handle medical type related information quickly. So whether that is meeting a reasonable accommodation, it's uh, taking care of a leave of absence, dealing with benefit coverage details, or helping with beneficiary details. As employees are experiencing different situations, having your information on the employee organized in a, a manner that allows you to get to information quickly and again, easily uh, to determine what is their benefit coverage or, hey, we have this doctor's note, we need to make this reasonable accommodation. Or if you're an employer of over 50 employees and you have to comply with FMLA, you wanna make sure that you have all of the documentation you need to respond in the required time frame for FMLA. And, and oftentimes organized files can allow you to respond in the proper time frame and, and to not uh, risk being fined for not responding appropriately. The other thing is keeping your information on employees organized for payroll purposes can allow you to see their salary history and their progression so that if an employee comes to you and says, hey, I think I need to be paid more, you can look and see how are they being paid? How have they been paid? What types of pay increases have they been receiving? And is this something we really need to look into? And really keeping things organized so that you can be more efficient and effective will help your approach with your employees, which can help with retention. Now on the, the topic of retention and recruitment, these are both topics I literally could talk about all day long, each one of them. Um, and we have done previous webinars on these. And I know that Amy um, has information on our uh, a recorded webinar that we've done on these topics that are on the uh, I Bailey YouTube channel. So she just shared that with us in the chat. Uh, so feel free to take a look at that if you'd like more information on retention and recruitment. All right, so the Form I-9, um, it literally is one of the riskier areas with regards to employment documentation. Uh, the government has this two-page form for us to complete to prove the work authorization of the individuals that we are employing, and they have a 72-page document that tells us how to complete that two-page form. So um, with that in mind, I would be remiss if I didn't talk you through some Form I-9 best practices, um, and I do see um, that the that someone posted in there that uh, the USCIS says that it recommends the the files are kept separately. Um, I, I don't know where I read somewhere that that it indicated it has to be. I do know that I've had clients who have been fined for having the I nine in a personnel file, so maybe that's where I derived my opinion from. But um, somebody's work authorization status. Uh, whether they're here as a U.S. citizen or they have a green card, um, there are reasons why you should not keep that information in a personnel file. 
Different people have different beliefs with regards to work authorization status, green card status, uh, people here on visas. And so to avoid discrimination in other employment areas, they do advise to keep that information separate. So I think that's, that's where my opinion comes from on that. So um, what I wanna do is cover some best practices because this is a high risk area where if the government comes in and audits you um, and audits your I-9s, this is the area where you get a lot of fines. And it's super easy to do a form I-9 audit. Like I said, I do them all the time. Um, what you wanna do is you have to understand what the Form I-9 is for. Again, it is there to, to document the work authorization and to prove that the people that you are hiring are legally authorized to work in the United States. So with this form, um, the way that you want to handle the filing of the documents is you want to have one file for Form I-9s for your current employees, and you want to have one file for Form I-9s for your terminated employees, because you do have to retain that documentation. Um, with current employees, as I mentioned, my personal favorite way of doing it is in a binder. For, for companies that have fewer than, I would say, 50 employees, it's a, it's a decent way of doing it. You can also maintain just a manila folder or several manila folders. Um, alphabetizing them is usually the best approach for current employees so that you can quickly and easily find the information when you need it. Um, but basically you retain page one and page two of the form I-9, and you may retain copies of the documentation that the employee provides to prove that they're legally authorized to work in the US. The thing is, if you are requiring the documentation, um, you need to require, I'm sorry, if you file the documentation that's provided by the employee, you need to make sure you do it for each and every employee. You can't pick and choose who you make copies of work authorization documentation for. There is a good reason for retaining it um, in the event that you are audited and there's some information missing or needs to be corrected. If you have copies of the documentation, it is far easier to make those corrections um, than if you don't retain the documentation. You also wanna make sure that you don't retain too much documentation. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but it is not required for you to retain the copies of the work authorization documentation, just page one and two of the Form I-9. For former employees, you have to retain page one and two of the Form I-9. And again, if you have made copies of the work authorization documentation, you need to retain those. Former employee I-9s must be retained for one year from the date of termination of the employee or three years from their date of hire, whichever is later. So if someone was hired June 1st of, of 2021, you need to retain, and they terminate on October 1st of 2021, you have to retain their Form I-9 until June 1st of 2024, because that is the longer period um, of retention versus one year from their hire date. When your employees term, I highly recommend just taking a little post-it note and putting on there the date that you can destroy the documents and destroy those documents the moment that you can. You do not want to retain these documents any longer than you have to. Um, and that, that kind of goes for most of the personnel file um, documentation for terminated employees. Only keep it as long as you have to. If you keep it longer than you, you need to, you are responsible for any of the information that is found in that um, in the files that you retain. So um, with the Form I-9, access is granted only to the person performing human resource, the human resource function for your company or for governmental agencies. No one else should see that Form I-9. It has no bearing on their ability to do their job. If somebody is here on a work visa, and there is an expiration date for that work visa or for um, any other type of work authorization, you will want to make sure you put a tickler on your calendar or in some sort of a file to follow up with the employee prior to the expiration date um, to let them know that they need to refile um, or to provide you with updated work authorization documentation. Um, but other than that, no one other than human resources or a governmental agency should have access to the Form I-9. 
All right, so with the Form I-9, the best way that uh, you can handle this is um, before an employee starts, reach out to them to let them know what to expect on day one, right? That's orientation or onboarding best practices basics. Um, you're reaching out to them to let them know what to expect on that first day. You should send them page three of the form I-9. You could send them the entire I-9 form, um, but have them refer to page three and let them know that on day one, they need to bring appropriate work documentation as listed on page three. You cannot guide them on what to bring. You shouldn't even make the recommendation, oh, hey, if you have a passport, just bring a passport. Or you know, if you have a driver's license and a social security card, bring those. You need to just tell them, I need for you to take a look at page three of four I nine and bring appropriate work authorization documentation. Um, you then should designate a specific person or department and train them appropriately on how to complete the Form I-9. What they will do is the employee completes all of page one. So the person that you are designated from your company to help um, complete it or review it would be to have them take a look at page one and make sure that the new hire has filled out every single section on page one. That includes things like middle initial, other names used, um, apartment number, those tend to be the three boxes in section one that employees miss nine times out of 10. They can put a dash in it or they can put NA in it if it's not applicable, but you wanna make sure that they acknowledge that they saw that box and here's their response to it. You'll also wanna make sure um, that they complete the um, preparer translator section down at the bottom. If they did not use a preparer or a translator to complete the form, they're gonna check the box that says they, they didn't use one. And if they did need a preparer or translator, they will check the other box and they will list the information relative to the preparer or the translator. You also wanna make sure that they sign and date it. And the form I-9 must be completed within 72 hours of hire. Otherwise, the employee should not continue employment until they can provide you with proper work authorization documentation. The employer representative also goes through and reviews that work authorization documentation that the employee is providing, and they fill out page two. Um, page two has line one, where it asks for the employee's last name, first name, middle initial, and what their work authorization status is. It has sections where they document the work authorization and then a section where they actually complete their information indicating that they verified the work authorization. Here's the date that they did that and here's the employee start date. So your representative needs to make sure that they fill out that entire section. And then if your company's practice is to retain copies of the work authorization documentation, they will make copies of it and they will attach it to the employees for my nine. When an employee is rehired within three years from the date of their form I-9, um, then you, and their work authorization is the same as what they indicated in the previous form I-9, what the rehire section will include then will be the rehire date, or if they've had a name change, they can complete um, that section, but that's not required. Um, you just wanna make sure that if you're rehiring somebody within three years from when they completed the original, that you're filling out that re-verification or rehire section. Um, if the employee's work authorization on the previous form has expired, you're gonna re-verify the employment and provide the rehire date and sign the date of the form. If the form I-9 is not the current version, you need to complete section three in the current version of the form and attach the original I-9. This is where that 72 page manual comes in handy. So if you ever have questions about this, just feel free to reach out to me and I can help guide you through it. Employees who are rehired after three years of the original completion of the Form I-9 need to complete a new Form I-9 and provide their work authorization documentation again. Um, so there is a, a, a clause um, that the government provides, which is called evidence of status for certain categories. And with this, this kind of gets back to that point of you can't tell an employee what documentation to bring or even make recommendations. Um, it's considered discriminatory to do so. 
Um, so employees must be allowed to choose which documents they present from the lists of acceptable documents, which is found on page three of the Form I-9. It is really, really important as an employer that you don't over verify someone's information by entering more documentation than is needed. Employees can provide one item from list A, or they can provide an item from list B and an item from list C. So if somebody brings you a passport, a driver's license and a social security card, you will only utilize either the passport as a list A item, or you will utilize the driver's license as a list B item and the social security card as a list C item. If you document all three of them, or even if you document the passport and the driver's license or the passport and the social security card, that is considered over verification. And there is a huge fine that is assessed for over verification. That is an indication to the government that you are trying, um, trying you're, you're requiring employees to provide more work authorization than they need to. Um, so just stick to the facts. It's either a list A item or a list B and a list C. If you go through your Form I-9s and you realize that there are errors um, that need to be corrected, it's really easy to correct those errors. So as I'm talking, if you know that you have employees who didn't put their middle initial, they didn't indicate anything in a the other names used or the apartment number section, um, maybe they didn't fill out that prepare a translator section, it's easy to have them fix that. Um, if you realize that on page two, you may have over verified information um, or the person who completed the, the section didn't fill out all of the, the spaces either for uh, the list A, list B, list C item or the employer verification section, you can correct those. The way that you do that is you go back to the form you either draw a line through the incorrect information or the employee does it. The employee handles page one, you handle page two. You draw a line through the incorrect information, you enter the correct information and you initial and date it with the date the correction is made. Or in the event that there's missing information, um, you put the information in and you initial and date it um, the date that that correction was made. It's very simple, very, very simple. Um, by doing this, you are making a good faith effort as, as the employer to get the I-9 form in compliance and that can mitigate or lessen the fee that might be assessed in the event that you are audited. So I highly recommend going back and taking a look at your employee files um, and either doing an I-9 audit just based on this limited information or um, having an outside consultant come in and look at an I-9 audit. You can either do just a few of your employees to see how, how good or how bad things might be, um, or you can do all of your employees, um, but you wanna make sure that you are getting your I-9s corrected. Um, as I mentioned, section one error, errors have to be corrected by the employee. One of the best practices is to just um, let your employees know, hey, we're doing a Form I-9 audit and we need to have you come in and make these corrections. If you have remote workers, it makes it a little more tricky, um, but you can scan the, the Form I-9, send it through some sort of secure portal because it does contain some pretty sensitive information to the employees, schedule a meeting to go through it with them and let them know what corrections they need to make. They can print that off, make the corrections, scan and return it to you. Um, section two and section three corrections have to be made by the employer. And if you have multiple errors on a form, you can either um, make those corrections on the original I-9 or you can, you can make the corrections on a new I-9 form and just attach it. Um, and you will always want to do some sort of memo or note that indicates, hey, our organization conducted a form I-9 audit on this date. Um, we found the following errors and, and corrected them appropriately. And the way that we are remedying this from happening in the future is we have modified our I-9 practices um, to, to, to ensure this doesn't happen. One of the best ways to mitigate Form I-9 errors is to use the E-Verify system. 
Um, it's a system that pretty much is foolproof. Uh, the employee completes their form online. The employer verifies the documentation, completes their section. They submit it. Um, it takes a little bit of time for the government to say, yes, this social security number matches this person, or this passport information matches this person, or this work visa matches this person, and they get back to you. If there are any errors, uh, like if no digits have been transposed um, or mixed up, uh, they will get back to you and let you know, hey, it failed for this reason, take a look and redo. Or if you have someone who is using faulty work authorization documentation, um, or illegitimate documentation, it will let you know right away that, hey, this person isn't authorized to work in the US. It is a phenomenal system. And when I've done for my nine audits for clients in the past, um, it pretty much has been foolproof that if they use E-Verify, none of those I-9s have corrections. It's all of the I-9s that um, I'm auditing from prior to them implementing E-Verify that, that require corrections. All right, so in the end, um, conducting an audit of your employees' records can help you identify gaps or inconsistencies with your HR processes. Um, as you're going through your personnel file audits, you might note that, hey, I've got some employees who have performance evaluations, I have other employees who don't, so there's some sort of gap with our process actually working there, and you can fix those things. Um, you can correct any inconsistencies and that can mitigate risk with regards to employment laws. And when you have consistent practices, it really allows you to focus on the business operations um, that move the company forward. And that can allow you to make things more attractive for potential hires and current employees. So with that, I apologize, I'm three minutes over, but if there are any additional questions, I'm happy to stay on, um, or you can put them into the Q&A feature, and I can try and uh, respond to those via email. And I thank you for your time. Happy Friday.